And welcome once again to In the Hot Seat with Deborah Fenella and Anthony James Mattox. Now, I'm really excited about today's guest because I interviewed him going back in 2018. And here we are again due to interview him today. Now, he's an amazing gentleman. He's a multi award winning filmmaker, script writer and author. Um, also, he's got his own podcasting show and he's a film coach as well. So welcome, Tony Klinger. How are you this evening? I'm uh, really very well, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, you, you're very welcome. I'm so excited that you're on the show, actually. Now, I've been reading up on your bio. You've been so, so busy with all of these amazing movies and books as well, including, obviously, um, The Man Who Got Carter. You've got The Butterfly Ball. You've got Deep Purple Rises in Japan. You've got Extremes. You've got Promo Man. You've also got the festival game, Full Circle. I mean, the list is just like endless, Tony, to be honest, not to mention, you know, Butterfly Boy, which was your best selling book as well. So I'd like to now actually take you right back to the very beginning because your father was actually a filmmaker, wasn't he? And his name was Michael Klinger. And he also knew Michael Caine as well. So please tell, take us right back to the very beginning, please, when it was all like started and your first fascination with the, the movie industry and scripts and reading the books as well um, that your dad was obviously sent to obviously go through whether he wanted to turn them into film, please. Well, it started off for me actually completely differently from my father. Uh, my father became... Uh, into the film industry when I was already uh, early teens, I think. And I had made my mind up to be in films when I was eight. Uh, I entered some competitions for writing and won them and won some prizes. And the prizes were chocolate and a visit to a chocolate <laughs> factory. And and for me, that was, it's a story I often tell, but it's the truth. The motivation for me was I saw a film, I wrote something down, and I got a load of chocolate. <laughs> wow, just like Willy really Wonka in the chocolate factory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. And <laughs> and I won the two I won one and tied for the other one first place. So people very early on recognised I had a talent for telling stories, writing them down. And I kind of was good at that. And when you're good at something. It's, it's the way you want to go because you go with the things you enjoy and you're good at. And I was that was what I could do. Um, and I didn't win any prizes for my maths or physics or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, could that up, I could that up, but that was about as far as it went. And I then went in that direction. And what then happened was, I didn't know when you're eight years old, how do you get back and become that become a career how do you how do you write and make films when you're eight years old you've got no idea and yeah. i kind of tried thinking what to do who to talk to my dad was an engineer and then he'd been working in the markets and then he had a nightclub so oh, he really? had, yeah. no i mean that's a, a sort of you know from one extreme to the other really isn't it well yeah he had nothing we had nothing uh he as far as i was concerned how would he know the answer to my question because he was in something yes. else in fact, when he started to go in the industry, I got quite angry with him because oh, did you? <laughs> well, that's where I was going and he was doing something I was going to do. And so I kind of, your, your father then really, Tony, when you think about it, then the fact that you went down that path first, you know, as a child, and then you inspired him to go, obviously, you know, from engineering and running, you know, working in a nightclub, running a nightclub, sorry, down into like the film industry. Well, I think he, he, he came at it from a completely different angle. Yes. What happened was he had a nightclub and the man who was the partner in the nightclub, and I won't characterise that the, the, the issues, but that man said there's another building and we could maybe have another club. And <laughs> what happened was my father went there and he thought it's never going to be a club, but I could do something else with it. And somebody else said, well, you know, maybe you could build a cinema out of that building. And it was That's in Old Street. And what happened was he changed it into a cinema and he was because he was an engineer he worked out 
with a, 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 an optical man how to have the projection because it wasn't it was too low and too flat you couldn't have a camber like you normally do so he worked out how to have the images bounced from behind the screen yes onto the screen by mirrors and wow. uh, yeah and, and and then he didn't know that you couldn't get films because he was the big cinema chains wouldn't allow anybody else to have films. They were had a system called logging and barring, which meant no one else could get a film. And if, if a distributor gave a cinema a film and they yes. didn't want to, they would then say, right, you can't have any more of our films. So they nobody would give him films. So then he had to turn it yes. into he turned it into a club and you yes. bought tickets for the club and then they showed the films for free. And okay. That's That's way it, it? <laughs> they banned him getting films totally so he could only show films that had been banned and oh, so bless him. and they were like politically banned films and then they became cheeky little sex films you know but not that like, soft and what then happened was the place became hugely successful and before a year was out he, he built more cinemas and then he became a big distributor and then he started making films it was that way around for him the opposite wow. me. it was completely the opposite way around for you wasn't it like you say yeah i, I came at it to and the only thing I, the thing i really thank him for was when i got to my teenage years and i he wanted me to go to university and i didn't want to i wanted to work and he said well you can take one year out but before you go work for anybody else, you're going to work in my company and you're going to have to do every department and every technical grade. And then <laughs> when, you, when I'm satisfied that you won't make us look like idiots, yes. then you can go work for other people. And that's what he did. And he, I had like my own private film school. Did you? <laughs> that's amazing and exciting as well, isn't it? <laughs> well, it didn't feel very exciting running around with coffees for everybody. And stuff. <laughs> it grew on me. and. It was a wonderful grounding because I learned how to project films. I learned how to edit films. I learned how to, to uh, everything about film I knew because of that beginning. And then I followed it up obviously for other people. And I was lucky, I've been blessed as, as a person like my dad with lots of energy. And yes. so I was able to like always be running and I, I still luckily can do that. And you know, with your health, you, if you've got your health, you can do anything. And I, I've been you fortunate. Can. And so, but I'm like, I'd like him as well, funny enough. We're very dissimilar in many ways. Other people think we're very similar, but I, you know, I, I can see the dissimilarities. But I, I, like him, I have what my mum used to call a scrambled egg brain. So I, I find I have to do lots of things. I, 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 I it bores me if I'm just doing one thing. You know and me. <laughs> I'm always doing things. Yeah, some people are like that. And so I didn't realise quite how brilliant he was as a producer, and I think he didn't realise much about me. So yes. when we, I was in my thirties when we we actually started to properly work together as partners, and oh, for three, three, or years, three or four years before he died, I had the good fortune to become his best friend, um, and it was wonderful because. You know, I obviously loved him as my dad, but yes. beyond that, I really gained tremendous respect for him and his ability. He was, he was he was the best film producer I ever met. So it sounded like that your dad was your inspiration, but also you were your dad's inspiration because you inspired him down that pathway in the film industry, didn't oh, you? I, I don't think that's true. I think I think I was, I don't. I think he inspired was inspired. He loved films. Yes. He, he, he didn't look like the kind of person that was as well read as he was. He also, because he was the son of an immigrant, immigrants, he he had a very continental feel to what he liked. And so he read, I remember as a kid, he was reading Dostoevsky and Emil Zola and all that kind of thing, and Dickens. And all, he, so he wasn't your average Cockney Barrow boy, which is what people okay. thought. <laughs> and he was quite brilliant and also had a photographic memory and you know so he had lots of advantages and good at sport but he was he was a, he was a top guy and so i really you know, I, at a certain point i realized well we're we're why why am i fighting that well that's that's the best person i could ever deal with or speak to or you yes. know it was, it was a pleasure to deal with it and he was a smashing lovely man
And I think it's wonderful that you could support each other as well, Tony, you know, with the work that you're both doing. Well, it's, it was, listen, I, it, I, I speak to other people and I realise how fortunate I was with my parents and yes. parents and, and how they treated me. And I've tried to be that supportive to my kids and, and their kids. And they, I think, you, you know, if you're nurtured like that, it, it helps, it shows. And, you know, yes. I, I didn't have any disadvantage like that. And we were tremendously, you know, when they talk about people being upwardly mobile, we yes. were ridiculously upwardly mobile. So I, I, he was from Soho, from the, the poor part, so which wasn't gentrified at all then. And I was born in Hackney. We then West Acton, the Isle of Wight, so on and so forth. By the time I was 14, from Hackney, from I mean, from a very tough part of Hackney, by the time I was 14, we were living in Grosvenor Square. And, was wow. Yeah. And so that was, like, extraordinary. Yes. But, so I was ended up with, like, really posh school at the time I was 14, and I and they couldn't figure me out because I, was, I wasn't an earl or a maharaja. Or, or which, <laughs> and they, they were jealous of me because they didn't have that kind of relationship. It was very, very weird. And, and the fact that I never got, I don't think I ever got more spending money than in old money, two and six months, which would be 12p. Yeah. I, it, it just said, well, go and earn it. And uh, well, that, that is a fantastic grounding because you learn the value of money. Yes, you certainly do, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and so I, I, I think all those values, all that learning, I'm not saying for example, because I do some teaching and coaching and stuff like that. I'm not saying that I am a better cameraman than my cameraman or a better sound man than my sound man. But what it taught me was no one can BS me. I know what the lenses should be. I know what the sound how it works. I can edit if I had to. I'm not saying I want to do all those things. And when I was head of, uh, say, the media department of a university, and there's hundreds of bits of software in there, I didn't think it's my job to know the details of each and every part of that because it's kind of impossible and it's changing constantly. Yes. But I had a broad and shallow knowledge so I could handle it and people couldn't fool me. And that okay. is the best thing in the world is because you can actually know what you're dealing with. And I, I think that's really important. I think it's a very valuable... I think it's, I'm blessed that I, got, I had that training. I mean, the rest is up to you. Once you start a person, then you, know, you can open a door for a person it's like somebody said to me about my dad and like it, maybe your career about your dad. And I said, you know what? I said, he's been dead since 1989. I don't think he's doing it, opening any doors for me. No. <laughs> and I, I think maybe he's your guardian angel <laughs> watching over you. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd like to think so because at least he's on my side. But I think, so. <laughs> I think you to make your own luck. And I think... You certainly do. And hard work and determination and effort you put in, you do reap the you know rewards of your hard work. And people don't realise how hard you work, you know, behind the scenes. I mean, sometimes I'm working till like one in the morning, plodding sure. through projects as well. So you get out what you put into in this life, don't you? This well, you do. And, you do. and, you, and what, what happens is certain instances, something happens and they and then you ha it, it brings you to the reality of what we what our time on this planet might be and and yes. how important every day is. I, yeah, I wear this thing and it's not a it's not a piece of jewellery. It's a. It's because I had an anaphylactic shock, and and the doctor oh, said I got to wear it, and died on the operating table. Oh, bless uh, you. About 13, 14 years ago, something like that, and I was, I was dead for a few minutes. And scary. Not, I didn't see any stars or angels or anything like that. I, 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 I'm not trying to make that claim. What I'm saying is, it made me realise use the time you've got because if you don't yes. use, it, well, it's gone. The one it thing. Is, okay. that, and that's why I don't waste any time. If, if no. somebody's wasting my time, then I'm on to the next thing because that's what is precious to me. It certainly is. I mean, I've had near death experience, and so is Anthony. My near death experience was going back in 1999, and Anthony's was 2012. And um, I'm sure Anthony's got um, a budding question he'd love to ask you as well, haven't you, Anthony? I think. Can you hear me? I think he's stationary. Oh no! Is he frozen? Bless him. He's frozen. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe it happened right now. Oh, oh, 
<laughs> we were just talking about near death experiences. Hopefully, come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he's got some problems with his internet at the moment. Yes, he does. He does. He looks happy. <laughs> <laughs> Bless him. He looks very happy, doesn't he? So yeah. you, you've also, um, I have noticed that you did actually teach at Bournemouth um, University in, in the film department as well, didn't you? Yeah, Bournemouth Film School. Uh, yeah, that's the other side, the Arts University, Bournemouth, it's now called. Yes, it is, yes. And, and uh, it, it had several names since I was there. And yeah, I taught there. I was. Uh, we had several programs. One of which I was a director of, head of course leader, whatever you want to call it. And then I was at the Northern Film School, and I was the program leader, course director for the masters program. And then helped develop the foundation degree and the degree, for, you know, regular degree. And then I was uh, head of a uh, director of three directorates at the. University of East London, uh, and eventually Amazing. it came out of that. But I still do some workshops and lectures and masterclasses and things. And I also have a, our own education department and our own coaching department. But that, that's in addition to all the other stuff. I so say you do phenomenal work. I mean, have you got any budding actors or movie producers in your family that you've inspired down that pathway? And it's like, yes, yeah, so I want to get on that, you know, film mm -hmm. set, doing a bit of acting or not. In my family, in my family, by, by, I'm, I'm going to America because I have American family originated in England. Uh, my daughter uh, collect, was collecting her doctorate uh, in clinical psychology. Oh, that's amazing. You must be so proud of her as well. Very proud. And she's the head of a big school and she's as well. And, you know, so I, I, I can't, I couldn't not be more proud. And her daughter, uh, my granddaughter, it collects her, uh, her bachelor's degree from UCLA uh, in May, uh, June, sorry, June. And I have two here that they've all done brilliantly. Um, none of them have the slightest interest in the film industry. Didn't they? <laughs> it, it, oh, bless them. But you must be so proud all of the paths that, that they have gone down, that they've been inspired to go down that path as well. Which yeah, I, I, well I, I, we, we always encouraged our kids and they've done the same for their kids pretty much uh, that you could achieve anything it's up to you and and particularly yes. for the young women in our family we always thought they could achieve just as much as the young men in our family it never it never occurred to us anything different and so i remember one of our the one that's picking up the doctorate that's the head of a big school i remember when they were when she was 14 they were saying to her she might make a nursery nurse and and that would be like at the limit of her uh, uh, ambition and she ended up with three degrees <laughs> that is phenomenal and, and i don't know how many ucsds and a levels but it was it, it uh, and our son played representative sport for uh Jude of england and other counties and things and and they if you give people the encouragement it's amazing what they can do. It's amazing. And and it's I don't think that's due to me, that's due to them. And the same same goes for teaching. You know, we had a phenomenally successful Bournemouth film schools and Northern were very successful. And basically that was getting the right people and letting them fly. And and removing as many restrictions and problems and making it as possible as possible uh, as to fulfill their potential that's what gets people to get results it certainly does isn't it and also believing in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself no one else is going to believe in yourself and confidence is the key as well isn't it but keep persevering and never giving up on your dreams because if at first that door doesn't open keep going keep going and eventually the right door will open you know and it's down to divine timing as well i believe now, well, no, as, long, actually, as, oh, as, long as, as long as you take steps because i find yes. some people have uh, you know they it's like i use the analogy as a uh, metaphor whatever you want, that that people some people are sitting a uh, mountain to climb and they think yes. you can leap it and you can't you have to do step by step by step and you know if you do it you'll find yourself something at the top of the mountain and if you say oh that wasn't as bad as i thought it would be what no. the, sometimes you have to say this isn't working 
Yes. Why is it working? And that may be a different question and a different answer. So you don't keep going blindly if, if, if you're getting slapped in the face because... It's oh, no, no, no. I mean, if you get too many doors closing on you, you think, hang on a minute, maybe I'm going down that wrong path. <laughs> I mean, I'm I do... I'm doing it the wrong way. I'm doing it the wrong way. That's equally problematic. Yes. Um, and I, 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 but I don't think there's only my way i think there's my way your way his way there's there's lots of ways most definitely <laughs> it involves what you said it involves lots of hard work planning yes. and application and having some kind of idea this should take this long if i yes. plan it right and if am i hitting those points or is there something going wrong yes. and also the other thing i found with people is to know what well, what is your value not, not just you definitely. What, what are you worth? Not yes. just money, but respect and self-esteem and yes. not getting beaten up by people. I mean mentally beaten up, I don't mean physically. Yes. Um, and, yeah, because I see so many people, and I, I, I said it today in my podcast, it's so easy for people to become supplicants. We're not supplicants, we're applicants. No, we are. And we're not on our knees. We should never be on our knees. And I yes. use the example... I, and I once did this. I, I will not wait more than ten minutes for a meeting. The, the time yeah. that there's fifteen minutes if I'm feeling really liberal, <laughs> um, I, 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 because my time is imp as important as your time. It really is. And so, so I don't care who it is, the doctor, the head of a company, the head of a bank, doesn't yes. matter. And I remember once doing that with the head of Universal, and I was walking down the corridor, and the secretary was going, "Wait, wait, wait, Mr. Klinger." I said, no, he's late. And then he came running down after me and said, no, no, it was a thing. And he was trying to explain it. I said, if I was the boss of Warner Brothers, would you have done that? Exactly. And it's manners as well, I think, yeah. to be honest, Tony, isn't it? You know, uh, again, if you've arranged a meeting at a specific time, you should make sure that you're there at that specific time for the meeting. You know, yeah, it's I, 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 I'm sure like you, I have tons of meetings every week. I have meetings. Yeah. Lots of I have meetings. lots of meetings. <laughs> uh, I have been late or missed meetings in the last 54 years three times. Well, I'm so organised like you, no one the ball. And that, I've had to cross continents, I'd be there early. And yes. I don't get there late. And I think that's the first part of courtesy. Is that it's that's really the manners. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's respect. It's respect. And it's, it, it is. I don't sound better than anybody else, but I'm their equal. I'm not going to yes. say I'm better, but I'm certainly not worse. No. Anyway, I, okay. I, I, I'm not excited, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, I know Anthony, bless him, is so excited about asking you a question. So I'm going to hand it over to Anthony to ask you now. Hopefully you're not going to freeze. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Can Hello. Hello. Okay? Um, excellent, thank you. It's nice to see you unfrozen. <laughs> 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 um, can I take you back to your uh, young 17 year old Tony Clinger when you were working in Avengers what did you exactly do in Avengers for your first job my first, well it wasn't my first job because I'd done a year working for the Ministry of Defence films and things like that training films it was my first proper high end television job and I was I was, yeah. I was I heard about the there was a potential job I went and got interviewed and I remember saying, the man said, and how much do you want, Tony? And I didn't know the number. I had no concept. I was like, so I said, <laughs> I, I was earning £12.10 where I was. I said, £14, like that. And he went, and he shook my hand, like, immediately. <laughs> <And> I realised <laughs> I'd done it wrong. <laughs> That's a war. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. And, and what then happened was, because of my energy, I, don't, I think more than my brightness or anything like that, I kind of ended up being the guy that was the go-to guy getting things organised as an assistant. I was the third assistant director. And in those days, in that kind of atmosphere, on a show that was financed out of America by ABC Television, they expected us to deliver in their way, like on time. They, we were taking 10 days an episode. They were doing it in like five or six of that kind of television. And so we were, it was really a rush. And so what happened was not only did we have a massive first unit we had a second unit sometime all the time and then we had a run by unit and sometimes this an extra unit 
At one stage, I think we had four or five units working simultaneously. And so if you were the low man of the totem pole, like I was, you ended up with some seniority on the small unit. And so I got to play. I mean, I was like running around, like seeing if I could maybe direct a shot and do it. I, I was very ambitious. And at the same time as I was doing that, there was a guy who was in another set, who was a friend of mine. He was working on Department S or Randall's Hotcut Deceased on the same studio. And we decided we wanted to make our own documentaries at night and on the weekends and maybe some commercials that we could, we didn't have any equipment, but we had to pretend we had equipment. So we decided, so on the weekend we were borrowing equipment <laughs> and shoots that we were on and wheeling it out of there and making our own little films and editing them overnight. So we were working literally 24 seven. We didn't stop. I, you know, we, I was, we'd hide so that the security guys didn't see us and wheel the stuff in, wheel the stuff out. We'd edit in their editing rooms. We had, and then we'd take all that stuff out every day. So they never saw what, they never caught us, never. And we, ended up, we made a couple of little documentaries. We made a couple of little commercials and we were making, making good. And on those, we were the boss, you know, like we were the directors and the producers and all that. In the daytime, we were the kids. And so, it was great, it was fun. I mean, I, how we did it, looking back, to stay awake, we used to play football down the corridors. <laughs> we had to do something. Yeah, we, we had... Six, Sorry? I was brought up with six, six TV, and um, I remember um, the champions, the 60s as well. That was yeah, it, just one season. And... Yeah. Um, I think it was um, one of the characters that one of the stars got interviewed said um, you must have enjoyed going to all these different countries. He said, you're kidding me, it was all done in England. And that was amazing yeah, yeah. because it was like they were in Russia, Kenya, yeah. Scotland, all these places. Yeah. It was all done in one studio in England. It's amazing. It is cool. amazing, isn't it, what they do behind the scenes? <laughs> well, we had a boss who'd been a lighting cameraman, a man called Jack Greenwood, who's no longer with us. And I would sometimes, if we were like out filming, you know, we used to go to a place called Burnham Beaches, which was not far away from where that is in Elstree Boreham Wood. And <laughs> if it was raining and the other parts of the sequence had been sunny, and I, I, somebody, sometimes me, would ring him up and say, Jack, it's raining. And because it didn't, the continuity wasn't right because the other scene before or after was sunny. And you'd put it, and he'd say, well, one sec, and he put his light meter out the window of this in the studio, which was miles away, and he'd go, it's okay, go film, now, foul, film. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, but it doesn't match. He'd say, tell him to put in a line, and the line would be, it's raining now, or it's sunny now, <laughs> and he'd match it up. And they literally didn't care about those things. They just, it would just everything was done expedient it was to be expedient and it was incredibly um actually i have to say i want to give credit to someone it, patrick mcnee was the steed and and linda thorson was our lead at the time and at one time oh, yes. i got in trouble with mr greenwood and the other people it's a long story which i won't bore you with <laughs> not to do with my filming or anything like that it was something he did and I came back and I, t I had, I thought, that's it, I'm finished here, I'm gone, I'm going to resign, I'm going to go. And because they were like trying to sack me, and I said, no, I'll resign rather than you sack me. And so I told Pat McNee, and then of course I said, I've got to go. And they, he said, what's the story? And I told him the story. They said, we'll go to lunch. And I said, what are you talking about, go to lunch? It's 11 in the morning. They said, we're going to go to lunch now, come with us. And they took me to a little restaurant that was around the studio, around the corner opposite the studio and we sat there and i said what's happening he said we're not going back to they re-employ you and i was the kid i was like 17 i said really they said yeah you sit there and then jack greenwood and the others came and said okay so what what's the story and he told them he said you're going to re-employ him or we're not coming back and he then said okay tony you got your job back and they said no now you're going to give him a raise <laughs> 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 and they gave me a raise. I had to go back, 
and I, I, I carried around my resignation letter after that because I knew <laughs> well, if they could, you know, anything. And so I, and I was a thorn in their backside because I was the first in the studio every morning and I was the last out. So the union guys, in those days it was very strictly unionised, the union guys used me as the guide for the clocking in and clocking out for everybody. <laughs> that meant, you know, because I was there, then they all must be there. But they weren't, but they, they pretended. <laughs> and so that made the overtime rates work. And what then happened was they sent a man from New York from ABC Television and said, who's this Klinger guy? <laughs> and I took me out. And I, and I didn't know why. And they said, you're earning more than the producer in overtime <laughs> for my £14 a week basic. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? They said, well, tomorrow from tomorrow, you come in, don't come in at 6 o'clock in the morning, you come in at 8.30, and you don't leave at 7 o'clock at night, you leave at the finish time, which is 5. You get So 8.30 to 5, then you go home. I went, okay, but what about, he said, don't tell me what about, you just do it. <laughs> So the next morning, they normally when I was there, we would get our first shot in the can by 9, 9.15. They didn't get a shot in the can of any of the units to about 11.30. And so it cost them thousands and thousands of pounds. <laughs> they said, why weren't you here, Claire? <laughs> <laughs> and they changed it back. Because they what, forgot. Because yeah. Because what an awful of your life, Tony, um, the, the who, the kids are all right. It's yeah. like um, when a new programme comes on, you always think, what's the theme tune going to be like? But it goes back to the CSI, using the yeah. who as a theme tune. And every CSI after that, you know, Who uh, song, song hit. It's like the Who way back in the 60s. You never thought they'd yeah. be under theme tune. It's amazing. But they've got, they've got their, the guy who runs their publishing, a guy called Robert Rosenberg, he, he, the, his, their publishing is now worth more than Led Zeppelin's, which they also handle. Um, and wow, that's amazing. <laughs> And they, they well those tunes, and they're very good tunes they're very good tunes and it's it's we've literally just finished we're well, finishing the new edition which is i think the third or fourth edition of my book about making that film called now the new yeah. title is who knows the making of a rock movie or really it should be called how not to make a rock movie <laughs> <laughs> but but somehow or other despite the nightmare it was making it the result is is a classic. So you can't, you, you never know what's going to work or not work. And that, but that experience was something special. And because of the research we've just done on that particular book, because we wanted to add some new things, I, the strangest thing happened. I, I don't know if you saw it on social media about three, four months ago. I posted a picture that the PR people wanted to put on the book cover of me. And I said, I think this picture is horrible i won't use the word i used <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if you think uh, you have a better idea please let me know and we got loads of replies and one of the replies said yeah that picture is terrible uh would you like me to take a picture for you and i thought oh, it's somebody pitching to try and get a gig and i you know i, I can do better with that and i couldn't remember the didn't know the name or anything like that couldn't think of it and so I kind of poo-pooed it. And then somebody said, well, you should ask him what he means. And so I did. And he said, well, don't you remember in the little office down below Bill Kerbish, the manager of the Who's office, there was me. He said, and we knew each other. And I went, oh, yeah. And I remember his name is Danny Clifford. And I said, well, that's really nice if you, you know, do you think you can take a picture? He said, oh, yeah, I'll take a picture. I said, well, how much is it going to charge? And he said, oh, no, this is free. It's just because I want to do it. And I went, oh, okay, uh, with no idea who he was. And then I looked him up. He's only the best rock and roll photographer in the world. And I had wow. no idea. <laughs> yeah. He, he I think I know who is that time. <laughs> he did little people like Bob Dylan and <laughs> The Who and Queen and The Queen and so on and so forth. It, like, it's, it's timeless. It's, and he's still doing it. And so that brought one part together. Then... I was talking to somebody else and they said, well, it'd be nice if you had a pictures or little stories from some anecdotes from somebody else. And so I thought, well, I'll try and reach out and see if I can find Dougal, who used to be Keith Moon's guy. And he turned up trucks and he sent me stuff. 
And then he said, do you know the woman on the beach that was there with us when we were filming? I said, yeah. He said, do you know who she was? I said, no. I said, I can't remember her name. He said, that's Nancy Lee Andrews. I said, that's okay. He said, do you want me to find her? I think she's in Nashville. <laughs> it turned out she was his fiance at the time before he married Barbara Back. And I met her at the time. And it turned out, because what <laughs> you should understand, while we were doing that sequence on the beach with Ringo Starr and Rick Danko and Keith Moon, at the same time, there was a, a thing going on where my executive producer, I was a producer, well, the executive producer, a friend called Sydney Rose, was being dunked in the ocean by Dougal and Keith running in and out in the ocean, <laughs> fully in the ocean, like drowned. And <laughs> then he came out and he go, the petty cash, the petty cash. I said, what are you talking about? And he had our petty cash, $30,000 in his pocket. Oh, no. So it was all sucking wet. <laughs> oh, yeah. The next scene, while they were doing the bit on the beach, was him. We filmed this. I don't know where the film is. We filmed him drying his money with a hairdryer. <laughs> and he was flying over the room. Was and, there one catch in it? <laughs> yes, I was making sure what of that. And, 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 but at the same time, well, let me finish. The same time as that, this woman was taking these photographs and turns out, she became a very major rock photographer in America. Is so, yeah. And so we just got her pictures today. So these things are very okay. complicated. How these things come together. It's like that's so difficult. I love it when everything just falls together, like you say, isn't it? Meant to be. It is meant to be. It's fate. One question, one question Tony, um, can I take you back to 1981 and um, Riding High? Oh, yes. And the yeah. The jump. <laughs> when you were making that movie, was the jump done before any filming was done? Because if any kid got that wrong, there'd be no movie. <laughs> so we did it. Was that jump at no, the end of the stopped. filming? End of the filming, and it was hor horrifically scary. In fact, you know, I'm still friendly with Eddie and Billy. Yeah, is, yeah, is, well, yeah. And. I don't know if you know this, but strangely and perversely, uh, the film went live in January on Netflix. Um, That's what it said, yes. Yes, this January, yeah. And <laughs> so, it. yeah, and it's it, it's really, it really was bizarre for me that, and, and very gratifying. We were arranging that, but <laughs> that Netflix jumped the gun. We were arranging to have a special gala thing for Eddie in <laughs> Brighton in easter time but this precluded that but yeah. yeah when we did that jump we did a lot of research we did a lot of pre-planning i think we had 13 cameras <laughs> and i was the person actually saying to eddie go and at that yeah. time he used to suck I, I i smoked till i was 40 i was like 30 then and what happened was I was standing next to him and I'm trying to calm him down. It's actually him calming me down. <laughs> and and I've, I think I smoked a pack of cigarettes and I was standing there in an hour. And when he went, I thought, if this goes wrong, I've killed a man. You know, like, I thought, terrible. however much you plan it, it could go wrong. And it yes. did go wrong. Um, you know, it was a very dodgy landing. Um, the landing was gorgeous. Yeah. And it, it was... He's a, he's a remarkable man, and he's still a remarkable man, and he's still got a sense of yes. humour, and he's, he's just yeah. special, and I just want good things for him, and so if we can help him, we're going to do that. And uh, and I I just think it's, there, is, there are a few people in your life that you meet, you think, that's a special guy. And, yes. and bravery well, is... Actually, not... Sorry. Actually, a video was for um, Eddie Kidd, and... Um, the phone rang one day, and it was actually Eddie Kidd phoning me. And I thought, <laughs> how, how crazy is this? The guy's been a hero of mine all my life, and this hero is actually phoning me up, thanking me for the videos I've done. I thought, it's a crazy <laughs> world. <laughs> it is a crazy world, but he is he, he's a special guy, isn't he? He's, he, he's he is. He is. Yeah. He's definitely. So you were actually... Yeah. Because you see all the um, movie clips from that jump, and there's like a lot of camera people in the bottom, obviously yeah. getting the aer aerial jump. Yeah. We're standing in the room behind all the action. <laughs> and I was, I was literally, you know, where he came down that road 
to the takeoff point, I was yeah. there. Yeah. I was like the... So were you kind of like, we, we like this when you're... <laughs> yeah, we like that I was, when you jump. Yeah, I did want to... I actually... I saw the takeoff, but I didn't see... I, you couldn't really see the landing, you know, as you land on the back of the of the thing. And I yeah. thought this gonna, it's going to go, because I, th I, I was sure, because of the maths, I was sure he was going to make the, the distance. What I wasn't sure was, it was yeah, the landing. Yeah. Joke. And in fact, that's what but got him, right. in the end, you know, in the end, in the accident which he did have, that was the problem, was the landing. Yeah. Exactly. No, it was, uh, yeah. It's, it's um, what was that? Sorry, I've got something else. I was saying about Under Thorsten was uh, the event um, when you joined the, sort of the Avengers. Um, were you just there for one season or did you carry on through many seasons? Uh, one year, I was there one year. And, and one year. Uh, yeah, when I, I, I saw, I was at a, th uh, a show in London somewhere, I can't remember, just just, during, just just before COVID, I guess. And Linda was there and she, and I thought she won't remember me because I was the kid then. And so I went up and I said, you won't remember me, Linda. And before I finished the sentence, she said, of course I remember you. And she recounted the whole story. And, she said, and I remember the lunch we had that day and she remembered everything. It was great. And she's a lovely woman, lovely woman. Which is wonderful. I mean, out of all of your movies, Tony, which, which movie was your favourite? I mean, I, I, I'm an actress as well, and I, I know when you go on film set, it's long hours. I mean, I was on film set yesterday, and I was at, up at 4 a.m. in the morning. So sometimes film set, as you know, it can be like 12 hours, it can be 15 hours and 16 hours. So it takes a lot of dedication, as you know, on film set. But I'd love to know, out of all of the amazing films, you know that you've been involved in which was your favorite and why please well i'm going to say the one i just finished this week called dirty sexy and totally iconic because i got to plug it <laughs> <laughs> we just sent it to the first okay, you can plug that one tell us about the um, storyline then please well the storyline is it's a celebration of the 50th plus anniversary plus covid of my dad's film get carter oh, and, really? yeah and we it was I decided at a certain point I was sitting here and I was thinking, it was just about COVID, just just coming. You knew something was happening, you know, like something bad happening. And I thought, it's the 50th anniversary of my dad's film coming up and I don't want anybody else telling that story. I want to tell that story. It's like, that, that's Wonderful. from my family. And so we started to do it. And then of course COVID hit and that made it really tough because Yes. Everybody was scared to come out and people were scared to be interviewed because it's like, you know, don't, you could be contained. We were having to test two, three times a day. It was a pretty nightmare. Yes. But I'm very, very proud of it. And I think it's worked out great. And um, and hopefully everybody's going to get to share it in this, this next few months because we've literally, literally just sent out the, the screeners um, on Tuesday. So it's That's what, awesome. So yes, will it be in our, our, you know, major cinemas as well, Tony? Do you think? I'll probably get some cinemas because it's not yeah. intended for cinema. It's intended for a bit of cinemas, festivals, and TV and streamers, which what well, the way it will mix different places around the world because it will go around the world. Um, yes. And it, it, I, the thing that sparked it was funny was because somebody said to me, "Have you seen how many people?" refer to get carter on the net and i went i wasn't really that you know i was like oh, okay and then they said you know it's, it's like hundreds of millions and i went oh come on you know and he said no look check it's a huge movie isn't it even now like you say you know it's a, i mean i've seen it myself it's a fantastic movie well the, the literally the numbers just i checked what he said and somebody said no i'll tell you tony it's 500 million and i went oh wow. come on. i mean and that then, is phenomenal isn't it amount of people a bloke rang me back and said, I lied. I said, how many? He said, 658 million. Wow. Yeah. And so I thought, <laughs> that's a lot of people. <laughs> it's a cult thing. And, and, and it's with love. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, well, funny enough, my dad never thought it was the best film he made. He thought it was the second oh, or third. He? he thought cul de was his best film with Roman Polanski. As a piece of filmmaking, he's probably right. But in terms of, <laughs> A film that has resonance throughout, well, now fifty something years, and it will continue. It's it's seminal. It's a seminal film. It's the film that inspired Quentin Tarantino. It's yes. the guy that 
film that inspired uh, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, Long Good Friday. That started a lot. And so I started to get into it. And then I thought, my dad always said, it's the beginning of our film, my dad always said, he left me a letter. And he said in it, take your time, think about it, take your time and then act. And, that's so important, is it? And that's what I did. I, I thought, well, this is the last bit of advice you gave me, I'm going to take it. And, yeah. and so we made it. And you know, people confuse it as well because we made also, which is now out in America, coming out here soon, The Man Who Got Carter. That's about my dad. This is about the film. Um, and oh. so, so two separate things. And basically, I guess, if the truth be known, they're both kind of love letters to my father. Um, oh, so lovely. And so that's why they they resonate for me. Yes. May not be the best film I've ever made. I mean, I suppose the most iconic film I've ever made was The Kids Are All Right, you know, with The Who. Yeah. Which was, yes. you know, we set a pattern for that. You know, that's my Get Carter, because that's also got a huge cult following and crazy numbers and things. But in truth, it's like, you know, if I can see my books are coming up here. In truth, you know, I'm, I'm a storyteller uh, and uh, an artist. And so what really the nearest thing for me to tell a story is a book. Because yes. that's me talking direct to you. And that's purely what I've, my vision. Once I start making a film, even if it's a small film, like a documentary, that's already a group of people together making something. It's, it's not, it can't be purely my vision or my story. And when you make a big feature film, like when we did Shout of the Devil, I was associate producer, we had over 2,000 people working on that film. So, so it's a giant, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's diffuse. It, it's very hard to be proud of every moment of it because you weren't engaged in every moment of it. You're kind of like a general in an army. You know, it's, it's, it's moving an army along. So the smaller it is, the more I like it. And that's yes. why I like doing those kind of films. And it's also quite more immediate and more compelling and kind of nearer to the vision you had to start with. So yes. I don't know the answer to your question other than the next one will be the best one. I, be uh, well, also, definition is imperfection, isn't it? It, it certainly is. Sorry to interrupt you. Also, what was your inspiration between, you know, um, with the Butterfly Boy? Was it actually based on your grandson, the actual book, please? No, that's a picture of my grandson on the front of that edition. We're now on a new edition of that as well. Oh, um, yes. No, what happened was originally, I can't say the name on here because I get in trouble. A, okay. a, a group of people, a foundation that are involved in a charity came to me and said, we've got this character and we'd like to make a, you to make a documentary about him. This is a long time ago. And I looked into that particular character who was a real person and turned out and I said to them, I said, you know, he was, this is their grandfather. I said, he was a bit of a rough diamond. Are you prepared for that to come out? And they went, oh, no, 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 we don't want that. And I said, well, it's really difficult for me to make an honest documentary and lie about the central character. I can't, I can't do it. You know, and, and they said, well, then we'd rather you didn't do the documentary. I said, what if I made a fictionalized account of his life? As long as you don't mention his name anywhere, we'll stay away from you and you stay away from us. And so it's based on a real person. It's based on an actual real person who, although disabled, became the person, and I'm being very careful how I say this, who invented mouth and foot painting for a charity. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Because it was actually a best-selling book, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it did. And, and what, what then happened was the he got investigated because of the charitable status in America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he survived, he, despite being disabled, became one of Hitler's favourite artists. And that's kind of crazy. Oh, did he? I discovered that there, that, that, that there was... Uh, thought that he was half Jewish, which makes it even more ridiculous. Yes. And he was then part of the Christian underground, which makes it even more crazy. So it was like kind of all these stories. I thought, I've got to tell this story. This is an incredible story. Yes, and, definitely. And he was, in real life, the man was Hemingway-esque or Steinbeck-esque, a big, strong guy, just didn't have the use of his arms. And he was an incredible womanizer, despite that. Was he? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> 
and he, he was and and would he would do carving of like stone with his mouth with his teeth you know a, a thing in his mouth it was incredible wow. yeah a, a big bear of a man and uh, I, I just thought this is one of the most incredible characters I've ever. I just love interesting characters against yeah. the canvas like that. You know, he, it's the story from him from when he was uh, before, just before the First World War, right through to he died in 1985. So it's the story of that arc, two world wars, all those things. His father became a Nazi. Uh, he did he really? Yeah. So very um, interesting character, like you said, that have, again, the story needed to be told, didn't it, like you say? Well, I think those things, uh, I could I could never understand. My family originated from Poland and Russia before that Germany, uh, hence my name. And so I couldn't understand how did a, the most civilised nation in Europe, most cultured nation in Europe, more than England, Germany yeah. was the, the centre. And how did they degenerate? To behave like they did towards the Jews and the Gypsies and the homosexuals, etc. How so that and and so it was trying to figure out well through the through one or two what well, through one family how that could happen and how it could happen again. By the way, and not just in Germany, some other place as well. And it's it's because you if you if you accept the big lie. If I say to you, you know, people with brown hair, they're very evil. And you go, oh, well, I've met a couple of bad people with brown hair. And they go, yeah, and they shouldn't ride on a bus. And you go, well, it doesn't matter, really. I don't think you're right, but okay, they don't ride on a bus. And then they, sh they shouldn't be allowed to have a, a, a bicycle. Why should they be allowed to have a bicycle, these evil bastards? And you go, well, it's not worth writing about. It's just a bicycle. And bit by bit, inch by inch. And if you read the diary of Anne Frank, the unexpurgated version, that's how it started in Holland. Yes, it did. I actually went to Anne Frank's house when I went to Holland and read her book as well. And I say, you know, seeing it firsthand, the actual room that she used to, you know, live in with her family. But, you know, I mean, it was a fascinating... Um, it starts with... It, it, starts with, it, it doesn't it's start great. with, I'm going to kill you because I don't like your hair. It starts with, you can't have a bus ride. It starts yes. with... The first, and that's why you can't allow any of it to be ever allowed. You, no. you have to fight and, and exactly. you have to be loud about it. And my way of being loud is to make a film or write a book or something. Yes. I'm so to be marching down Trafalgar Square. <laughs> and you do phenomenal work. And I'm so, so proud of you, Tony, as well. And I know that Anthony has got one more last question to ask you because we're running out of time now. Unfortunately, I mean, we we'll have to interview you again, Tony, because um, we've got so many questions. To, we'd love to have you back on the show. So one hour is not long enough, really. <laughs> one last question for you, Tony. When the movie, the Tony Clegger story comes out, who do you want to play yourself? Oh, Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I never even thought of that. I must tell you quite a side side story. I was in America, and a guy who's a friend of mine, who's a billionaire, he owned a big American football team, and he invited me to lunch the next day. And he said, "Tony, I want to talk about making a film of your book." And I just and my book Under God's Table just come out, so I was thinking. He wants to do that, and I was very excited. And like, I'm all there, you know. Like, he says, "Who do you want to play the lead?" And I was, I was, I'm thinking about that book, and so I'm saying names. He says, "No, that's not right. That's not right." Why are you saying those names? I said, "Well, it's the right for that character, that age." And he said, "No, I want to do your book about the who." He said, he want to do that. Yeah, and he said, "We're talking about who's going to play you, just like you could say." <laughs> <laughs> okay, same answer. Brad Pitt's obvious. <laughs> I have to introduce you to my friend Len Gibson. He's a big shot LA producer and okay. he runs them um, at Peachtree Film Festival. Interviewed him on the show going back, I think it was last year as well. So I'll link you up with him because he, he might be interested in obviously um, doing one of your books as well. Okay. Uh, is that with the, the, I've, got my, I've got my new novel coming out also later this year. No, beginning of next year. Called have Al you? Alsatia, the search for treasure. It's set in the 17th century in the centre of London. It'd be oh, uh, wow. a fun novel. Um, and it's based on a real place. I think one movie that would be a big hit to um, Tory is the Eddie Kid story from very young to where he is now. Yes. 
That's a watch. Well, there's been people talking about that for years, and Eddie did. Eddie did yeah. talk to me about that quite recently, and I my my problem is time. Um, as yes. I said at the beginning of this thing, literally, I've, I've got enough material to be going for the next two or three years, and. I love doing it, but it gets to a point you say, well, I've got to concentrate. I'm doing this, I'm just doing a thing called It's Not in the Script, which is a feature film with associates in America. Um, I'm, I'm just finishing the script of that, the fourth draft of that, tomorrow morning. So, you know, it, it, it can only do it, you can't do everything, you can only do what you can do. Um, and sometimes there's not enough hours in the day, Tony, is there? Because I mean, obviously, you've got the show must go on as well for David Courtney, and you're, you're very busy with that too. Um, but as I say, you do amazing work. I'm so proud of you, and um, it, it's lovely to interview you today. And I so say, we definitely would love to have you back on the show, wouldn't we, Anthony? Be my pleasure, and, and, and we'll have other new things to tell you about when we do. Excellent. Oh, definitely. And also, just before we do close, um, Tony, what sound advice would you give somebody that would like to embark either, you know, um, doing script writing, writing a book, or doing film producing, please? Other than the obvious that they should come on Tony Klinger Coaching, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing I suggest is, as a starting point, if you look on my YouTube, Tony Klinger YouTube uh, channel, you'll see there are a bunch of podcasts I've been doing exactly about that subject yes. and how to get into the movie industry and why and what not to do as well as what to do. And it's a series, we're on, we just did number nine of a series of, which would be 12. Um, and then we go on to other more in-depth things, but that's there plus our hints and tips are there. So it's worthwhile and it's for free, I'm not charging you anything. Don't want anything from you people. <laughs> Feel free to tag me as well, Tony, because I've got loads of um, budding, you know, script writers and film producers and actors on my Facebook page who would love to maybe learn more about it. So please tag me in any posts and Anthony as well. Well, if it's of any interest to people, what we're also doing, because we do the expensive, very one-on-one uh, -on -one and small groups, like five or six people, you know, yes. coaching sessions. We're also about to launch uh, later in the summer uh, groups, much bigger groups, which will be less interactive, obviously, because of the bigger groups, but yes. pretty much exactly the same thing with less interactivity and much cheaper so that people can access it that don't have much money. And that will be for exactly the groups you're talking about. Oh, that's brilliant. And if you need any budding actresses, I know my friend Liz Presley really would like to start, you know, sort of going further into the film industry, just like her dad, Elvis, as well. So please bear her in mind. Um, I'm just putting a good word for her. <laughs> and I can um, link you up. <laughs> she's, she's a big advantage with that name, obviously. That's a good starting oh, exactly. point. Uh, say so she's a lovely lady, Elaine Elizabeth Presley. And she's got a heart of gold as well. So I'll link you up with her, Tony. If you've got any, you know, projects in the future you'd like her to get involved in, she would love to. I'm sure she would. Okay. Okay. That'd be smashing. And it's been an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Well, oh, who, does, who doesn't enjoy talking about themselves? I mean... <laughs> We, we've loved having you on the show. And we just wish, actually, that we had two hours. <laughs> and I think even two I hours would be enough. Uh, honestly, I've printed out so much information about you, 15 pages, and I still haven't got through even half the questions I want to ask you, and I'm sure Anthony hasn't either. So we'd definitely love to have you on the show again in the next couple of months, and then we can talk further about all of the other things that you've been up to too. <laughs> yeah, well, we, yeah, there's, you know, I, 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 if somebody came to me and they wanted a job and they had, they put the uh, bulked up their CV a little bit, and I said, you know, you shouldn't do that. He said, well, don't you do that. I said, actually, for the last few years, I've been reducing mine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. You know, I've just done a lot of stuff, I suppose. It's you know, yeah. yeah. And I say, you've done phenomenal work, and I'm so proud of you. And keep shining bright as well, Tony. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you both. It's been good fun.
Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so, so much. And thank you so much to our London producers as well. Moino and Moino's lovely daughter and Slim as well. And also to our sponsor, Dip in the Pond Landscaping. Now, we'll be back again in two weeks time with, an, with another wonderful guest in the hot seat. And thank you so much for everyone that's watched the show this evening as well. And if you'd like more information on Tony, you can actually um, either private message myself or um, I can introduce you, obviously, to Tony Klinger through his email address with his permission as well. Or also um, you can get more details on our In the Hot Seat with Deborah Fenella and Anthony James Mattick. So wherever you are in the world, thank you so much and bye for now. Mm -hmm.